Thank you very much, Paul. I'm glad to be here. I feel um, very much as if um, I've come from sort of a spiritual battle. I, I'm a little bit numb from it all, but uh, I'm here because I want to share with you some important principles and important facts that you may not know. I've been involved in a real spiritual war between those who believe in freedom and those who want to control the thinking and speaking processes in our society. Those who want to control things are generally those who already have control and they fear the loss of that control and the substitution of other people in positions of authority because knowledge is power and knowledge has been monopolized particularly knowledge about certain things like how to get into power and how to stay in power and how to communicate with those who are in power so I'm just concerned and a lot of other people are concerned that if the monopolis, not monopolization of power uh, is to continue then oppression is more and more necessary and <clears throat> this is what we see, or this is what I have seen most frequently, the development of more oppressive control of expression. And why is this a problem? I mean, really, what's wrong with control? Society doesn't appear to be <clears throat> in dire straits. People aren't dying on the streets of starvation and mass uh, diseases. What's wrong with control of communication? What's wrong with controlling the Internet? What's wrong with controlling radio, television, newspapers? What's wrong with stopping people from saying things that other people find offensive? What's wrong with shutting up Ernst Zundel or James Keekstra? After all, the things they say are offensive to some people. What's wrong with stopping people from speaking about race, religion, politics in some different ways? What's wrong with that? Well, the reason that it's all wrong, and the reason why I fight for freedom of speech as I have can be capsulized in a simple expression that's been said by other people resistance to oppression is obedience to God <clears throat> and though many many people don't like to talk about or use the word God it's offensive to some people but I still choose to use it I hope you don't mind But, but even if you don't accept the concept of God, everyone, no matter what their race, religion, or ethnic origin, really wants to find truth. However they may define it, it is the common denominator of all human beings that we are not entirely satisfied to eat and sleep and breed and feed. We want to know, in some cases to love, in some cases to serve, the truth that that is what essentially touches the hearts and minds of all humankind. So that it's true for everybody, whether they believe or don't believe, that resistance to oppression is obedience to God. As human beings, we know that the essential drive in our lives has always been to seek the truth, whatever it may be. And we're never really satisfied until we think we have found it. Another aspect of every struggle, every time we fight an, an enemy, no matter who they are, the major difficulty we have is knowing our enemy, because we live in a world where we don't know very much, really. We hear a lot from other people, we hear it from the media, we hear from uh, our friends and neighbors, but what do we really know from personal experience? Not a whole lot. So that knowledge being power, the essential thing to have if you're in a struggle is knowledge of your enemy. Another concept that's fundamental to learning and understanding about truth and about life and about our nature and why we are always looking for truth is capsulized in the saying that many of us have heard, know the truth and the truth shall set you free. We all want to be able 
to understand our world. So what is the truth? What am I talking about truth for? What's going on here? Why am I worried about truth, about freedom? Why am I talking about oppression? Let me give you a little recapitulation of battles I've fought, some I've won, some I've lost, and how it affects you and everyone in this world, everyone certainly in Canada. Let me talk about three teachers, some of them you've heard about. James Keekstra, Malcolm Ross, and the last speaker, Paul Fromm. This will show you a progression from oppression that is considered justified by some to oppression that is considered justified by fewer people and to oppression that is considered justified by no reasonable people. First of all, James Keekstra was accused and correctly accused of expressing his political and religious views in his classes and that he chose to believe in the difference between good and evil and he definitely criticized and identified evil as he saw it. Nobody suggested he was dishonest. Nobody suggested that he didn't believe what he thought and what he said. And many people believed that he should not have been a teacher. But this country went further. This country made him a criminal for saying and thinking and speaking what he honestly believed because it promoted hatred of a group based on race, religion, or ethnic origin. They have now added to that, you cannot promote hatred of a group based on sexual orientation, whatever that might mean. That could mean pedophilia, necrophilia, goodness only knows, certainly homosexuality. All kinds of sexual orientations might exist. No one can ever promote hatred based on any of those, even if it might be morally abhorrent to you. But that was done to James Keekstra, and the law under which that was done was verified by the Supreme Court of Canada in a judgment four to three. So he lost his job, he became eventually criminalized and paid a fine of $3,000. After going through courts for 10 years, twice through the Court of Appeal of Alberta, maybe three times if you think about it, twice to the Supreme Court of Canada, maybe three times in that regard as well twice through trials that lasted months. An individual who nobody denied was honest, sincere, and forthright. Maybe too forthright. That happened to the first teacher. Then, then things progressed. I said in the case in Ottawa, in the Supreme Court of Canada, in the Keekster case, I said, this is the beginning of a slippery slope. You're going to go after James Keekster, and it's very easy because he's been so vilified it's not going to be hard to convict him. I mean, what jury could ever acquit someone when they've been demonized like he was? Okay, it's an easy thing to do, and they did it. And they thought, well, uh, you know, I think in their own minds, some of them thought, oh, well, it's only James Keekstra, and we're not going to put him in jail. We're just going to give him a fine. But I said, it's a slippery slope. It's the beginning of the end for freedom of speech. The next teacher was Malcolm Ross. And he never said anything in his classes. He was an exemplary teacher. He was never accused of saying the slightest impropriety in his class. And he taught adult education and especially handicapped children uh, who were having problems. Well, ironically, he published a book, or several books actually, in which he expressed not political beliefs, not racial beliefs, but his legitimate, honestly held religious beliefs. Again, it offended some people, because when you express religious beliefs, some people believe that, say, for example, there might be a God who says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me, and uh, that might be the Christian religion, as some people believe it, and as he believed it. And therefore, he believed that other religions were wrong, and he published to that effect. He also published against abortion, which he happened to disbelieve in or believed it was an evil. He compared it to the Holocaust. Uh, he published books about Christianity versus Judeo-Christianity. Basically, his thesis was that there is only one Christianity and it cannot be Judeo-Christianity because Judaism and Christianity do not regard the same person as the divine Son of God. So there's a difference between those two religions. I think there are many Jewish theologians who would agree that Judaism and Christianity 
are fundamentally different, primarily over the identity of the most important person to the Christian religion, Jesus Christ. Was he or was he not the Messiah? Judaism says no. Christianity says yes. Now, in some people's minds, and perhaps logically, that's a pretty serious difference of opinion. And if you happen to believe, as Malcolm Ross believes, that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, he chose to say what he thought and publish it in his own actual books, what he thought. Now, notwithstanding that none of his opinions were ever expressed in school, notwithstanding that none of, of his students were ever affected by his opinions outside of school, the media made a major issue of all that and created a situation where one of his, oh, not one of his students, one of the students of a uh, person in the district, David Addis, complained to the Human Rights Commission that because of the fact that Malcolm Ross taught in the school district and his n views were known to be anti-Jewish, therefore he could not be a teacher because this child could not feel that her uh, religion would be given as much respect and be treated, I don't know by whom, because no one treated her any differently other than some students, she said. And those students were never alleged to have had any contact with Mr. Ross, nor had they referred to Mr. Ross as the source of any of their views uh, which they expressed. They had said things that were definitely uh, offensive to her, and she had said things to them in the school ground, in the playground, and she was in grades, I don't know, three or four or five maybe, not much more than that, early, uh, early years. Mr. Ross was fired from his teaching position by the order of what's called a Human Rights Commissioner. Now, how ironic that a Human Rights Commissioner could be able to prohibit someone having a job because they, Malcolm Ross, had exercised their human rights to express their religious beliefs. It really is almost a form of insane inversion. I don't understand this. But anyway, that happened. We appealed to the Court of Queen's Bench. We won. Some of his restrictions were removed. We appealed to the Court of Appeal. We won again. All of his restrictions were removed. He was back teaching in the class. And they appealed to the Supreme Court of Canada and Mr. Justice Laforet, who comes from New Brunswick, gave the judgment which made sure that everything was undone that had been succeeded for in the other two court hearings. And he was fired, his job was gone, he could not be a teacher, he could not be even a janitor in the school district. So he is unemployed. The third teacher is Paul Fromm. He spoke last. Now, what is his crime? Well, actually, it takes it one step further. He has not said anything in class, he has not done anything in class, he has not done anything in Toronto of which they have any complaint, he has not done anything in Ontario of which they have any complaint. He'd done two things that got him fired. He spoke at a funeral service in Urbana, I think it's called, Illinois, and he spoke at a free speech conference in Vancouver, British Columbia. Those are the two things for which he was dismissed. And his case is now before labor arbitration and going on. So I say the three teachers are examples of what's going on in Canada. But how many people know this? You see, ignorance is the means whereby freedom is really destroyed. And I want to commend you and anyone who listens to what I'm about to say for having the courage and the intelligence and the perhaps determination to find out because you will not find out anything of major significance on this issue in the Canadian media or really in any media because freedom of speech is not popular with the media they have a monopoly on communication and they want to keep it what's happening in another way is equally threatening to freedom of speech CSIS Canadian Security Intelligence Police intelligence service. I mean, it's almost an oxymoron in, in effect. <laughs> and in Canada's case, all the more so. Recently, I gather it's been revealed that CSIS is in close contact with and works in conjunction with the Mossad. That's revealed by our ex-ambassador, Mr. Spector, to the great embarrassment of Mr. Axworthy, who promptly denies it and says that Mr. Spector is being mischievous. <laughs> Mr. Spector says that the exchanges of information and cooperative efforts took place in the embassy in Tel Aviv where he was, what? 
The janitor? No, the ambassador. One might think he would know what he's talking about. Of course, it would be illegal, so Mr. Axworthy promptly denies that it ever happened because, why? Because he knows? No, but because it would be beyond their mandate. So it couldn't have happened. And we Canadians, generally, have no say in any of this, and we're told, just basically believe what your superiors have told you. So, CSIS is the modern thought police. Let me explain what I mean by that, because that's a statement that hasn't been supported by very much in the way of facts, other than just what I said about Mr. Spector's recent revelations. CSIS has done some interesting things. They created a, a person who virtually created the Heritage Front, which made a big name in Toronto, Grant Bristow. It turned out he was being paid by the government of Canada to create the reason for his surveillance, namely the supposed right wing that was supposed to cause great violence. Ironically, the right wing never created any harm to anyone other than itself. Um, CSIS, funding Mr. Bristow, financed the creation of the Heritage Front, and Mr. Bristow did a number of things. He actually made sure he took me out to dinner to try and find out if I was going to call evidence in the uh, Finta case, which was a big mystery, I guess they wanted to know. Um, he also uh, was spreading around information to suggest that you might be able to find the addresses of prominent Jews, and I think he wanted to cause people to do harm. This is a government agent, of course, trying to create the very mischief that he is designed to forestall and stop. But of course, when this came to light, they turned it from being really what it should have been, the Bristow affair, into none other than the Heritage Front affair. So instead of investigating that which was virtually criminal, that is incitement, the creation of, of acts of espionage against Canadians who are lawfully involved, and in, in my case, defending someone in a criminal court, in, instead of taking issue with that, CERC, which is the Security Intelligence Review Committee, decided that they would investigate the Heritage Front and lo and behold, they concluded that, my gosh, there was such a tremendous threat from this right-wing organization that everything that Mr. Bristow did was entirely justified, albeit it was close to the line. So what, in effect, I say is a situation current today simply is that CSIS is the thought police. They supervise political activities and decide who is legitimate and who is not. They actually, at the moment, are not apparently interested in two people called Thurston and Barbarash, who the RCMP have informa information and have watched for many years, and these people, uh, there is every reason to believe, have distributed bombs, one of which went to Ernst Zundel's house, uh, another of which went to Alta Genetics in Alberta and nearly killed someone as it blew up. Um, others of which went to uh, institutes like the McKenzie Institute in Toronto, which by a miracle did not explode. The, I've read the information to obtain the search warrant in these cases, and it's amazing how much they know. They know when the uh, bombs were loaded. They know how they were loaded. They know uh, where they were sent. There were some sent to media figures with mouse traps with uh, poison on them, or at least it was alleged they had poison on them. Uh, this was the type of thing that CSIS doesn't seem to be able to stop. Um, you know, when you think about it, it's utterly amazing that CSIS regards there to be a right-wing threat, and I'll show you later on where they think that's all the threat that there needs to be concern for. Uh, yet, these are the activities. There's been a bombing of, of uh, a person in Canada by Canadians, and they were definitely not right-wing people. There's been the arson of Mr. Zundel's house. That's definitely not by right-wing people. There's been uh, razor blades and other things sent through the mails by uh, people who attended ARA meetings. That's not right-wing people. But later on I'll show you, because it happened recently that Mr. Zundel you know, the person that the media loves to hate, and we're all supposed to hate likewise. Um, Mr. Zundel found an audio or videotape of a conversation that took place in uh, Kitchener, I believe, between a Mr. Michael Roth 
a German-Canadian businessman, and two people who identified themselves as CSIS agents. And here's a brief summary of the conversation, of, actually an excerpt of the conversation. Peter, quote, In Toronto, Wolfgang Droger of the Heritage Front has been troubled, much troubled, by a group that calls itself Anti-Racist Action, ARA. This is a collection of anarchists, Trotskyists, Stalinists. And then Angela says, The ARA that Peter described firebombed Ernst Zundel. I'm sure you've heard about the problems various leaders of the so-called right-wing have received firebombs. That's the end of the quote. Now, there are several things that I personally would ask you to consider from these statements. First of all, if they were from CSIS agents and on videotape, and I tell you that having had this complaint investigated, I don't think that's denied. I think that's admitted. It's remarkable, but it appears to be uh, admitted. If that's the case, then we have agents of the Government of Canada telling someone, guess what, You're, the purpose of interviewing Mr. Roth was to inquire as to whether he had had meetings with David Irving in his restaurant, perfectly legal meetings in which Mr. Irving spoke. And what I think they were conveying and what I perceived from the videotape was this, My, Mr. Roth, do you know that ARA have firebombed Ernst Sundel? Are, are you having meetings here of the right wing? I mean, I got the message very clearly. The, the message was, look, the ARA are violent. And if you have right wing meetings here, you know what happened to Mr. Zundel? That's the impression I got. I thought it was very clear. And yet, from Mr. Zundel's point of view, I can see the position. His position was this. If a government agent is saying that ARA firebombed Ernst Zundel's house, why haven't they done something about it? You know, arson is a crime. Even if you're Mr. Zundel, it's still a crime to burn his house down or to try to do so. And uh, if they know that, why haven't they reported it to the police? If it's true, why do they say it if it's not true? To try to scare somebody into changing their political persuasion? Well, when it comes to that, here's what else they said. These are other things they said. And it's really amazing what they said. At the beginning of the interview, the CSIS investigator explained the mandate of the Security Intelligence Service to the person being interviewed in the following terms. Quote, the Canadian Security Intelligence Service is like BFV, a Deutschland Besicherheitsdienst, Bundessicherheitsdienst. I guess that's uh, State Security Service. And uh, this is, these are his words. And he spoke at that time in German. Obviously, he could speak German much better than I can. What we look after is threats to the security of Canada and that we also do the security clearance for government employees. But primarily what we do is look at counter-espionage and counter-terrorism. What are they looking at? People who are counter-terrorists, they watch them? I don't understand this, but nevertheless. And then he says, and, and we're, we're the political police. He said it. And he said it correctly. In, and then he goes on to say, in that respect, we are the counterterrorism branch, and specifically what we look at is the potential for violence related to activities in the right wing. I've heard of people blind in their left eye, but this man is definitely blind in the left side of his brain. <laughs> but, but, he is not out of touch with the directions of the Canadian government. He is not out of touch with the vast majority of the media, who are all basically left-wing anyway, he's not out of touch with his, his um, commanding officer's wishes, I suspect. What I think is expressed in these words is very clear. We look at the potential for violence related to activities in the right wing because they don't think or don't want to see that there are much more potential potentially violent activities in the left wing. As I said, there are no bombs being sent in Canada by any alleged right wing groups. There are no razor blades and envelopes full of poison, blood or whatever being sent from anyone alleged to be right wing. But there are no concerns being expressed by people like this about that because they look, as he says, at the potential for violence related to activities in the right wing. 
What we have then, I think, is a bias in the security intelligence police who are basically thought police and they have decided that it's only right-wing beliefs that they are going to be operating against and they're using people like Bristow to supervise, infiltrate, create havoc and incite, if they can, violence to justify their activities in the, quote, right wing. In addition to this, we have human rights commissions who I call the New Inquisition. They are the inquisition for the new morality, the new religion. We used to live in a time where religions involve convictions about the other world. Now we live in a time where the new religion involves convictions about this world, and the only convictions that really seem to matter are that there is no truth, uh, there is nothing that can be uh, justified as being held as a fervently uh, and passionately held belief. We should all be moral relativists. We shouldn't hold things that are intolerant. The tolerance itself is the only virtue. Well, you know, between good and evil, there should be no tolerance. If there is good, it must be supported. If there is evil, it should not be tolerated. Tolerance of evil is not a virtue. But that, to the new inquisition, is heresy. And the human rights commissioners have enormous powers, albeit they can't put anyone immediately in jail, what they do is decide who can speak, and who can say what, and what can be said. And of course, if you cannot communicate in a rational sense, then the enemies of freedom have a means to isolate, alienate, and criminalize their political opponents. And that's effectively what's happening. Let me give you a few instances of human rights activities. Doug Collins, a columnist in North Shore, Vancouver, has written a number of times against immigration, multiculturalism, homosexual lifestyles, all the politically incorrect things. And he now and his newspaper have been taken before the BC Human Rights Commission who say they have the authority to supervise all publications. And the North Shore News has had to spend $200,000 trying to convince one commissioner, not a judge, that this is an unconstitutional law. And they've done all this before they ever get to court. And of course these impact prosecutions have a very chilling effect on anybody else. We don't have $200,000. I don't you don't, and we're not going to take the chance of having to be dragged before a one person, in this case one lady, tribunal, to uh, try and plead that we have a right to our opinions when we know very well she's not going to like our opinions. Uh, Nitya Iyer, um, a professor at the University of British Columbia, is in my opinion not very sympathetic to Mr. Uh, Collins' views about immigration, because it affects a lot of people who came here recently, as probably she did. Um, and I said uh, that it's likely that he is going to soon face Nietzsche's ire, because I don't think that he's going to find that uh, her views agree with his, nor do I think she's going to tolerate his views. It's great that they speak of tolerance, but they never really have much tolerance for views they don't like. So we're confronted with these two phenomena a form of thought police that's out of control. We have teachers being dis disciplined, in fact, silenced in their political and religious freedom. We even have CSIS deceiving judges to get wiretap authorizations that are basically unconstitutional. Basket clauses were found to have been introduced by Madam Justice McGillis into warrants that many judges had signed without consideration. Now, what's a basket clause? Well, a basket clause, as I understand it, says that if I have reason to believe that I have a right to tap your phone because you, for instance, are involved in some nebulous or nefarious activity, I have, when I get the authorization to tap your phone, I have another authorization to follow that tap to anyone you talk to that I think might have some evidence of some activity and tap their phone. And if I think their phone conversation with a third, fourth party, 
third party, and on and on and on. Third, fourth, fifth, it can go on so that many more phones can be tapped with the one authorization. This is very much like the Star Chamber. It goes beyond any judicial review. It, it prevents judges from controlling the surveillance activities of the police. Now, what happens in police states is that everybody is watched. Soon, organizations, every meeting you must consider will be surveilled, will be supervised in a sense, and anything said will be scrutinized and gone over for breaches of the Human Rights Act, um, threats to the security of Canada. Of course, they're going to watch everybody and decide later if there's any significance to what they say. This is the way police states are created. Actually, Parliament tried to control CSIS. Parliament tried to control CERC. And once again, some members of Parliament, Val Meredith, a very courageous reform member of Parliament, said that CERC was not the watchdog, dog. CERC was the lapdog for CSIS. And CERC, CERC had been in contempt of Parliament because they were evasive in their answers. They did not answer parliamentarians when they said, why did you do this? What happened here? The reason why the Reform Party was upset, of course, was because actually Mr. Bristow, oh, we must assume he was doing it on his own now, uh, made it very clear to the public and created a situation where the Heritage Front was connected to the Reform Party just before the, not the last election, the election before. The one where the Reform Party stood second in, what, 50 ridings, where the establishment, the Liberals and Conservatives, could have lost control of the Parliament of Canada. Well, of course, that can't be allowed, can it? We won't allow these uh, unknown entities uh, at best, or rednecks at worst, from Alberta uh, to become a significant political voice in this country. So actually, a CSIS operative made sure, just by coincidence, just by accident, without any involvement of his handlers, that the Heritage Front affair should come to light and tarnish the reputation of Mr. Manning and his party at the worst possible time. Nobody, nobody believes with a, in their right mind that that wasn't orchestrated. But if the people who know are not obliged to say, well, then how are you ever going to prove it? And if they are not responsive to members of parliament who ask questions, or if they're evasive, or if they're contemptuous in their answers, nothing will regulate CSIS, and CERC will never do the job. It's clear that if this continues, a police state is inevitable. Well, what's happening has to be resisted, and it cannot be resisted by force. It must be resisted by reason. And how can it be resisted? There are three simple ways that freedom is being destroyed. Certain individuals are being targeted, and the tactic is very simple. You first isolate those people, that is, hold them up to public ridicule in the media, make sure that they are vilified in the media, then alienate them from their friends. This usually happens almost simultaneously. It happens with Keekstra, it happens with Zundel, it happens with Malcolm Ross, it happens with anyone who crosses the path of the politically correct. The media become the instrument of their isolation and alienation. Their friends draw back because, of course, we really don't want to associate with somebody who is a villain. And we're afraid to be attacked as their friend because if we're their friend, well, we're racist too, right? That's what's happened, of course, to me because I defended the rights of individuals who were accused of being racist, bigots, or anti-Semites, and maybe falsely so, I too am therefore labeled and therefore accepted by the vast majority of people exactly that way. Guilt by association. And the media are masters of this, and the enemies of freedom are masters of this technique. The fact of the matter is that Isolation, alienation, and criminalization are steps to the reduction of dissent. And dissent is the only method by which people learn new things. If there were no dissidents, there would be no reform of anything. We would all be learning from the authorities exactly what they wanted us to believe, and nothing would ever change, nothing would ever improve. It's only through dissidents and the expression of dissident opinion that anything in the way of progress occurs. 
So what do we have to do in the face of isolation, alienation, and criminalization? We have to overcome those through the same techniques we've always had, and that is investigation of what is the subject of the attack, investigation of the people being censored, in the sense that I say, I want to find out what they really think. Go and talk to them. Ask them. I've heard all sorts of terrible things about you in the media. What do you really believe? Dear, are you really a racist? What is a racist? What are you? Ask them directly. Get in touch with them. Find out whether all those terrible things you heard about them is really true for yourself. Be an inquiring mind. <laughs> and to overcome alienation, be a human being. And say, look, I don't agree with a lot of what you say, but I really... I, th I like you as a person. I like what you do in that although I don't agree with what you say, I admire your courage in standing up for your beliefs. I think you're totally wrong. I think that you're being counterproductive. I think you're hurting yourself. You say whatever you like about it. But in a tolerant manner, say, I still want to support you in your right to freedom of speech regardless of what you say. And I don't want you to feel alone. I want to help you, and if you're going to court, here's 10 bucks, 20 bucks, or whatever I can, so that you will be defended. Because we all know that money buys a lot of things, a lot of books, a lot of legal research, a lot of people that will help. And ultimately, if they don't have that, their uh, resources will never match those of the state, and they can never match those of the media, so they're just going to be crowned to the dust. And don't forget what happens to the least of us happens to all of us. So that if we don't defend the rights of each and every person under attack, when all they do is speak, I'm not talking about the advocacy of violence. I'm not talking about the advocacy of anything that is destructive. I'm talking about the expression of people's honest moral beliefs in which they may or may not vilify what they consider evil. And if it happens to involve discussions about race, religion, ethnic origin, sex, sexual preference, sexual orientation, disabilities, so what? If you can't talk about those subjects in such a way that you can honestly express your views, then what is talk for? What is communication for? Then we would really have no freedom. And ultimately, if we don't do this in regard to everybody, none of us will have the right to speak. Now, how do they criminalize people? Well, of course, they have to go through the process first of isolating them, then alienating them. And what often happens is when people are alienated and isolated, they get bitter and twisted and angry, and they will do things that they would not otherwise do. That really is how society is, is broken down, how rational discussion is eliminated. So overcoming that will prevent criminalization because it will prevent crime. And that's ultimately what we should want to do. Rational discussion, nonviolent action, education about the problem, mutual support and recognition, and tolerance of each other is the way to overcome alienation, isolation, and criminalization. Keep sane in an insane world. That's not an easy thing. And I run into that all the time when I'm sitting into a room and, and we're talking about a professor of linguistics from... Uh, we're with a professor of linguistics from uh, Calgary who's never viewed the subject of the prosecution, which is located in California, and he's telling us what the uh, meaning of words is on a website he's never seen because he's looked at parts of it that have been pointed out to him in highlighting on a piece of paper sent to him by a prosecutor in Toronto. <laughs> I tell you at times, you've got to wonder um, whether we're in the real world here. People need jobs, people need uh, education, people need sometimes old age pensions, they need Medicare, and we're going to decide whether or not it's legitimate to operate a website in California that was accessible to people who hate each other <laughs> in Canada. Wow. I mean, uh, the Toronto Mayor's Committee on Race Relations, Sabina Citron, do not like Ernst Zundel. They have been trying to get Ernst Zundel a variety of ways. And always for what? For what he said or what he wrote. That's all. And whether you like it or not, really nothing else. And having had all the efforts they've made to get his postal privileges to try and criminalize him through 10 years of court proceedings, 
having tried to charge him three or four times with promoting hatred. And at each time, either the courts have said that there is no validity to the law, or they have said there is no substance to the charge, and in most cases the prosecution have said, we're not going to proceed with the charge. Not being satisfied with that, they've now taken the issue to a human rights tribunal, and we're going to spend from now till June, probably, 1998, spending hundreds of thousands of dollars investigating a website located in California accessible by those few people who might find the web address and might not know enough on the internet to dial it up and might then make a selection of the thousands of pages that are available there and might find some segments that promote hatred based on race, religion, or ethnic origin. Are we really in the same world or not? We wonder about the role of the media. Really, is there independence in the Canadian media? In actual fact, they participate quite actively in the bloodhound process. They act as the bloodhounds for the government on policies of multiculturalism, liberalism, pro-abortion, pro-homosexualism, and pro-government control. There's no dissent. They're all yes. All yes men. They're in favor of all those positions without really major deviation. Oh, there are columnists who occasionally disagree. Then, but otherwise, in terms of media, I think you'll find that a pretty universal outlook. Well, that's fine. I don't object to their right to the outlook. All I'm saying is that they really have no tolerance for opposing views, particularly if they're not bought and paid for people. The future issues in which we will see this struggle for free speech crystallized in the coming year are really quite major. There's the McAleer case, which will go to the Supreme Court of Canada on December the 10th. I've lost all real hope for these issues because I don't think that the court, at least at the present time, uh, have any particular um, agreement with my view of freedom of speech. Uh, there, this case involves two cases, actually. One where Mr. McAleer had messages on his answering machine. And before they ever got to a hearing of the Canadian Human Rights Commission to see if they were illegal and contrary to the Act under Section 13.1, they went to a federal court judge, filed some affidavits, and convinced them that these were bad messages, and he agreed to ban them even before there was a hearing because he didn't like those messages, and he thought they could be discriminatory, and rather than take a chance, we'll shut you up first, have the trial later. Well, that worked. And Mr. McAleer, thinking that he had to comply, did, as far as he was aware, and took his messages and his machine over the border into the United States. And had he not referred to it in Canada, it would have been okay, apparently, but he on his old message machine said, the Canadian Human Rights Commission says I can't have my messages anymore, but if you want these messages, they're sort of down the line. You phone long distance on this number and you'll get the same. I don't think he said you'll get the same messages, but you can get messages. And they probably were the same messages. And those messages, incidentally, were a collection of messages from other people about the persecution they experienced for freedom of speech. So he, the real object of censorship is to censor the knowledge of the censorship. Because you can't have no people knowing that there is censorship because then it wouldn't work. People wouldn't tolerate it. You've got to keep people ignorant. If they don't know who's being censored and they don't know there is censorship, why are they going to get upset? I'll tell you, they're not. And that's why there isn't a thousand people here concerned about censorship. They don't know it's going on. And they're not going to be told. In fact, the knowledge of that is also censored. That's the mark of a successful censor. Eliminate the knowledge of the censorship. Getting back to Mr. McAleer, what happened? Well, when Mr. Justice Muldoon made his order, which silenced the telephone answering machine even before there was a human rights hearing, they uh, established an order that if Mr. McAleer breached it, he would go to jail for contempt. Well, when Mr. McAleer referred to the American messages on his Canadian answering machine and said, phone them if you want them, guess what? He was cited for contempt before Mr. Justice Teitelbaum would send him to jail for three months. And you know where he was when he was coming up to give evidence in his, in his tribunal to see if those messages were against the act or not? Do you know where he was? He was in jail and couldn't testify. Isn't that neat? That's how it worked. I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. He wants, you know, he might want to testify. 
He might, might want the opportunity to show you that these messages are legitimate, that they are fair comment or whatever. No, we can't adjourn until tomorrow morning for you to get him out on bail so he can come here and justify himself. No, you can't have an adjournment. Whereupon I walked out and tried to arrange bail with a judge. These are not judges, of course. They're just human rights commissioners appointed at the pleasure of the Prime Minister. No, another one of the many Prime Ministerial appointments, Canadian human rights commissioners, are not uh, established with any tenure. They have, I think, a term but they are subject to the pleasure of the Prime Minister who appointed them. So anyway, we appealed the Muldoon order. I said that's an invalid order. He has no authority to make the order. It's like a judge saying to you, uh, you can't breathe. Or like me saying, don't make so much noise. I can't put you in jail for it. <laughs> Fortunately for you. <laughs> but... You see, the situation was that the judge had told him, don't breathe, and then, although the order not to breathe was not a valid order, he breathed, so that's contempt. Now, you know, I mean, this is like never, never land. It's the Mad Hatter's Tea Party, right? But it's the Canadian law. And so... I appealed the Muldoon order, said it's without jurisdiction. Human Rights Commission appealed... Uh, no, I, I appealed both. I appealed both. Muldoon and Teitelbaum. The Court of Appeals said, you're right on the Muldoon order, he had no right to make the order. But he had the duty to obey, and therefore the conviction stands, but the sentence is reduced to time served. In other words, you got something, go away and don't appeal. I think that's what it tells me. You know, what do you got to win? He's done his time, now just go away. Not this guy. <laughs> so I appealed the finding on the title bomb order, and they appealed the finding on Muldoon, and there we are up on the Supreme Court of Canada December the 10th, fighting it out all over again. And I might say that for the first time, because there was a sentence, I think that legal aid might cover my travel costs. But until then, all that fighting had been done, including the Human Rights Tribunal, without any legal aid, without any money, because he was bankrupt. So you see, they don't provide any means to defend free speech. There's only a few idiots like me running around who'll do this for nothing for very long. And eventually people like me burn out anyway, right? As you can see. That's what's happening with Mr. McAleer. And of course, that's a long, long story, one that's too long to tell tonight, because there's more to it than this. But that's going to be at least interesting. Paul Fromm's case uh, is working its way through the arbitration process. Will, I, I gather, someday perhaps be rectified or perhaps end up in court. The Zondel case with the Internet is going on and on and on. They have all kinds of money. Guess how many lawyers there are for the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal in this Internet case before the Human Rights uh, Commission. No, it's the other way around. They're the commission and they go before the tribunal. I can never tell them apart, you know. <laughs> Um, there hasn't been a big difference, too evident yet. Um, anyhow, uh, that's going on and on, and uh, it's all over an internet site in California, as you well know, and that uh, is a case where the Human Rights Commission has Mr. Benny QC, Mr. Fryman, from um, a huge firm called, I think, McCarthy Tetro. I, I, I have trouble with that word. I think it should be theatro. Um, <laughs> Then there's uh, Mr. Taylor uh, from the, the commission itself, and I think one other lawyer. But that's only the main prosecution. Then there's intervenants from Canadian Holocaust Remembrance, all against us. Canadian Jewish Congress, all against us. B'nai B'rith, against us. Um, oh, uh, Simon Wiesenthal Center, or Friends of Simon, against us. Uh, there's another one, I know up my mind, but they're all there. I, I suggested, and I wasn't really being that sarcastic, that with any further interventions they should move it from the court, which was a very large place, to a theater. <laughs> because, because as I see it, it's intended to be a show trial at which all of Mr. Zundel's political enemies get a chance to get a real good kick at him. And one thing, I, when, I, when I grew up, 
as a boy, I was rather a small child, but one of the things I really loved most of all was, was, um, was, was fighting. <laughs> and I didn't like to hurt anybody, and I really didn't like to get hurt, but I did like snowball fights, and in Winnipeg, where I grew up, that was what a lot of the fun was about. And we had these snow piles in the schoolyard. I don't know where this is going to end. I don't know where it's, where it's really going either. But there were these piles in the snow, uh, piles of snow in the schoolyard made from, you know, snow plows. And uh, we always used to see who could get to the top of the pile. You know, you throw the, your enemies off the top of the pile and you stay there for a while until they throw you off. It was a lot of fun. But the one thing I hated about fighting, and I always got into every fight where I saw it, was where five or ten guys start to kick the hell out of one guy. That really bothers me. And nothing gets me into a fight quicker than seeing that, because I just can't stand to watch somebody getting punched out. And that's what I always felt about guys like Zundel and Keekstra, because I don't know these people that well, never really did. I've got to know them o over the years pretty well. And, you know, uh, you can't help but like people when you know them. I think generally that's true. Um, but I hate to see the way these people have been attacked on all sides. And I think right now with Mr. Zundel, he's just about at the end of his tether, you see. He has been kicked around, really seriously kicked around. As a human being, I think that he's really, really uh, exhausted from a, a terrible, terrible fight that's gone on for far too long. It looks to me like the bullies are circling, they've got the boots out, and he's on his knees, and they are just about to finish him off. That's the way I read the situation. And I don't like the look of it, and I don't like to see him stand alone, and I'm not much stronger myself at this stage, but I'm not going to let him go down without a fight. And that doesn't mean by any means I agree with him on anything or everything, because I do disagree with him on lots of things. He knows that, and I know that. But on the essential things about his right to his views, to express them in the way he has, whether some groups like it or not, I do not compromise. None of us should compromise on that. That should be a fundamental principle. And if it was the, the shoe on the other foot, and there were all kinds of German groups or any other ethnic groups uh, deciding that certain Jews couldn't speak about what they thought, I would be defending their rights too. And I don't think that it would make any difference to me. The result's the same. You can't have ten people kicking somebody down. So there's a few other fighters that are uh, on the march and doing their best. I mean, Doug Collins must be almost 80. I don't mean to insult him, but I know he's over 75. And there's a man who could just walk away and forget it. He's now retired for about the fourth time. He has stayed on with his column and fought alongside of his publisher. And we recently honored Mr. Speck with, I think, the 12th annual George Orwell Free Speech Award for having the courage to just stand his ground and defend the right of freedom of expression. <laughs> Mal Malcolm Ross, for his part, has taken up a struggle again against a really nasty defamation. He was asked to go, or could go, and I think was expected to go, to one of these teachers' development <laughs> seminars. And at the seminar, the subject of the seminar was <laughs> Malcolm Ross, in essence. And uh, pictures were flashed on a screen, some of which indicated uh, this was by the cartoonist himself, I think Mr. Um, Bechtel or something, um, in which, uh, you know, it was very, very funny. It portrayed Mr. Um, Ross with a uh, pencil stuck up his rectum, and it said, the crucifixion of Malcolm Ross. Oh. Yeah. yeah, that's only a, a minor example of the poor taste, but this was in front of all the teachers with, he, with whom he worked. And this is okay, you see, because I'll tell you how that works. You see, once you are, quote, a Nazi, a racist, a bigot, a hate monger, you are not a human being, and anything is legitimate. 
to vilify in that way would not be tolerated for anybody else. But once you've been demonized in this fashion in the media, no one dares say, but he's a human being. You wouldn't dare because they'd say, you're one of them too, you racist, bigot, Nazi, hate monger. You see, it's the same process of stereotyping that they so often complain about. And there is, I object to uh, vilification of anyone. And I don't participate in it based on race, religion, or ethnic origin or any other grounds. Judge people on their individual merit. Judge them as they are. Judge them as they try to be, often not as they are. We're all capable of fault. But this process of vilification has become almost a hysteria in Canada. And the only enemy that the government sees, the only enemy that sees this sees, is the right wing. Well, it's just plain and simple bias. And the average person would not accept it if they understood it. Our job is to communicate what's going on so the average person can make a decision for themselves. Another person who's taken up a legal remedy, and I might say Malcolm Ross's case against the NBTF, I think, New Brunswick Teachers Federation and the cartoonist, will go to trial in February. Another person carrying an enormous financial burden that I'm trying to help without one ounce or penny of public money to defend I don't think it's just his own reputation. I think it's the right to a decent respect for almost everyone, because no one should be treated like that. And we'll see what happens there. The Presslers have started a lawsuit against Mr. Lethbridge and uh, CHBC TV in, in Kelowna. Their activity was to put on the news a program that repeated all the rumors they could gather about the Presslers and their property where they were building their home. A compound, a barn with spiral staircase and carpeted floors and multiple phone jacks, a self-contained communications network, bunkers in their compound. All this was spread to the people of not just Kelowna, not just Salmon Arm, British Columbia, Canada. And this for what? for building a 3,165 square foot home on their own property for a tri retirement purposes. You see, naturally everybody then uh, boycotted their business, naturally everybody then um, avoided them, shunned them. And of course, uh, this is okay because they're right wing, right? They're associated with other right wingers. So whatever we do is okay. They're not humans, they're right wingers. That's what exactly is going on in this country. And it's the, the elite, the media, the power brokers who are doing this. And it's not right. So we hope that some kind of legal recourse is possible. We hope that some justice is possible. And we're going to use legal, democratic, politically acceptable means to achieve it. Because as I said in the beginning, Resistance to oppression is obedience to God. Anyone who loves God, loves truth, loves freedom. And our duty to defend these things for ourselves, for our families, for our loved ones, for our children, will not be the cause of a day, of a month, of a year. This is the cause of a lifetime. As long as we have life and breath and reason, we must preserve life and breath and freedom and therefore we have a noble goal purpose and cause it inspires us to be better people to communicate with our friends and neighbors in a better way and to take that challenge and do it because no one else is and no one else will this is our time of greatest challenge this time will test the metal of our souls we must stand together for principles of free speech. We must not abandon anyone who is under attack. We must not ask ourselves, do I agree? Are they nice? Do I find them pleasant? We must not ask, are they polite? Are they decent? Are they honorable? We must ask, are they human? And if so, do they have a right to speak? If the answer is yes, we must be at their side and defend them. Today we have a duty. We must commit our strength and all our capacity to unite in a cause that's worthy of each of us 
and is essential for our children to have a better life. Because you can give people pensions, you can give them clothes, you can give them hospitals, you can give them all the material things, but if you cannot give them the means to spiritually, logically, rationally find the truth, you give them nothing you wouldn't give to an animal. And we must give more, we must give more to our children than we would give to animals. We must give more to our ancestors who died for these rights. We must give more to them than we have given. We must give action, reason, peaceful, and positive speech. Amen. We have uh, clear knowledge that if we uh, don't do this, we only get weaker. We only will get weaker tomorrow. This tyranny is growing. It's not diminishing. It is not something that's going to go away. There is no easy solution. There is no quick fix. The we got this way over a long period of time being apathetic, indifferent, and contemptuous of other people's problems saying, I'm all right to hell with you. You probably deserve to get all that bad press because you opened your mouth, right? That's what we say about most people who get in trouble. And it's so easy to do. And that process of looking after me too is, what's that? What's that? Do you know what that is? That's isolation. And that's the first step to alienation and criminalization. Because if they can do that to you, they can do that to your neighbor. And gradually we all sit in fear in our, in our homes, waiting for our pension check, wondering if somebody's watching whether we got more money than the last guy and whether Grant Bristow's next cousin is, is, is listening to our telephone. We live in terror. And, and the communist countries of the world had this situation for many, many years. They didn't need spies. Everybody was a spy. Everybody wanted to help the government to suppress freedom. Everybody was afraid that maybe their neighbor had more on them than they had on their neighbor. <laughs> it's our function to do everything in our power by peaceful means, using freedom of assembly, using freedom of speech, in our little newsletters, in our little meetings, in our little get-togethers to educate, to inform, and to arouse the people to fight for freedom while we still have it, because if we don't, we won't have it. It's disappearing rapidly. Everybody's standing back and letting it happen. Nobody's getting too upset about it because it hasn't hit me. And I'm not Ernst Zundel, I'm not James Keekstra, I'm not uh, Malcolm Ross, I'm not... Tony McAleer, and they're all bad anyway, and I'm not Doug Christie, thank goodness. But, ladies and gentlemen, when each and every one of us are gone, if you ever open your mouth, if you ever have an original thought, if you ever dare to say it, it'll be your turn. And who will you have to defend you? So you better get together, help each other, help me, help anyone who's in trouble in this time, because it's a time of trouble. If we stand together, we won't have to fear Grant Bristow's and Carney Nerland's and the David Berberash and all the rest of them. We won't need to fear the Peters and Angela's that'll come knocking at our door. We'll know we live in a society that is free and will be free because we're damn sure we're going to make it free. Thank you. <laughs>